In politics, we tend to focus almost exclusively on the winners, those who run for office and finish on top. But for every winner, there are, of course, losers. On October 19th, Canadians saw some familiar faces, conservatives and NDPers, disappear from the political landscape, replaced in many cases by liberals who helped Justin Trudeau form a majority government. The winners have been the focus of a lot of media attention. But what about those who lost? What is that experience really like? In a moment, the insiders on the politics of losing. But first, Megan Leslie, former deputy leader of the NDP and former MP for Halifax. We sat down earlier today not to talk about the politics or the issues of the campaign, but instead to try to understand what losing is like. Here's part of that conversation. Now, on the night of October 19th, a lot of national observers and analysts were, were surprised, if not shocked, uh, that a, a number of people lost, and certainly that, that you had lost. Yeah, now, me too. There were, were, okay, <laughs> well, I want to get to that. So there were, you know, obviously there were national trends that had an impact everywhere. Mm -hmm. But on that sort of gut instinct yourself, were you surprised that night what happened? 100% surprised. Totally totally and utterly caught off guard. You had no inkling through a campaign? No. And and I hope that people don't think I'm just hopelessly naive. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why I thought I would be okay. Um, first of all, through the campaign, you know, you look at the track record of a, a local candidate if they're an incumbent, and, and people were happy with the record, the, my record. They were happy with their representation. And then, when you are a candidate, you are not supposed to follow the national trends. You are not supposed to worry about, do we have this many canvassers on this day, or what is going to be the messaging in the next brochure. All of your energy for those days of a campaign is about you being the best you you can be. And if you are going to be that best you when you're knocking on doors and talking to people, when you're at debates in front of crowds, you have to be just focused on that. So I didn't know a lot of the inner machinations. And I think most candidates would tell you the same. Um, you have a team. You've got to put your trust in the team to take care of that. So you're just actually knocking on doors and meeting people and smiling and listening. And when you were knocking on doors, yeah. or when your canvassers were coming back, nobody was saying, something's going on here that we can't quite well, figure out. For sure. For sure. There were indications, but I didn't think the indications were strong enough as it was happening. I knew, so my campaign manager um, was a wonderful campaign manager, and she did sit me down. I had said to her, I know, I, I don't want to know the details, I don't want to know how things are going, but if, if it looks like we're losing, you've got to tell me. And so she sat me down uh, before election okay. day, and she said, it's going to be close. Now... That was your first yeah. serious inkling? And I was like, come on, Tammy, we're going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, so, so there's my experience of it in the moment, and then there's putting the analysis over it of talking to my colleagues and looking at what happened in other ridings, and I have a clearer picture of what happened now than I did then. Uh, but at the time, like, I, on election night, so election day you go around to, there's these zone houses where all the volunteers are gathering to pull the vote, getting people out to vote, and I made sure I went to say hi to all the volunteers, and then I went home, and I had something to eat, and I put the party dress on, right? I had on the clothes for the victory party. And uh, I got a text from my campaign manager, and she said, Peter Stauffer's behind. And that's when I thought, oh, we're losing. We're, we're losing this. <laughs> and so, so that's... Um, that's where we were, and I went and put on concession speech clothes. And Out of interest, <laughs> what's the difference between a party dress and a concession outfit? Gold lame <laughs> versus suit jacket. <laughs> I was gonna have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so that drive to the the campaign headquarters. Yeah. That must have been tough, because I guess in some level you're still kind well, of hoping, maybe, or um, do you know by then? By then you know. I had received a phone call from Tom Mulcair. So I went down. I'm going to try to explain how it feels. I, mm. I went down, and you see everybody, and you you 
are grateful. And of course I had tears in my eyes and lots of hugs and thanking people for the work that they did. And it was, I'm gonna get emotional saying this, it was seeing Alexa McDonough, who wrapped me up in a big hug. And I lost it a little bit then at that moment. And it's because I was that worker for her. And I understood. And so seeing her and thinking about the loss of that riding, of the riding she represented, and thinking about the work that I put into her campaigns, and then knowing that even though I was looking at her, all around me were all these people who had put the work into my campaign. Um, that was a really tough moment. And, and it's that people lose jobs, right? And you figure out what to do next. But one thing that's different, I've been trying to think about how is this different than a plant closing or yeah. if you're a barista and your coffee shop goes under, you know, how is it different? And you are, even though you've lost, you are still a public figure. You still represent something to someone. Like I said, I had about the same number of votes as in 2008. So, so people worked hard on my campaign. They took signs, they donated, they, they came out and talking to them and it just, that part is really hard, but it also almost never ends. We're a couple months away and I still see people and those emotions come back because I know what they did and I know what it meant for them. The night of, did you sleep at all? Uh, not really, not very well. But in thinking about how this is the same as other people losing their jobs, right? It's a full body shock, you know, I, I slept a little bit and then I woke up in the morning and my first thought, this is ridiculous, but my first thought was like, oh my God, we have to sell the house. You know, it's not rational to think that way, but that it's just like this panic about what does this mean and what, how, do we, how do we pay the electricity? I mean, it, we're not at that point the day after an election, obviously, but that's where your brain goes, like, what do I do? And you're kind of in this... Uh, fight mode. I wouldn't say flight mode, but fight mode. Um, and then, Did somebody talk you out of that? Yeah, Maybe? my partner sat down and was like, look, we're going to be okay. We don't need to sell the house and sort of laid that all out. But I think that's uh, a response that anybody would go through. You know, for some, it, it, it takes a long time, mm -hmm. uh, not just to get over it. I, I'm sure it takes, you know, it will take a long time to, to get over it. Mm -hmm. But to move on. In talking to my colleagues, there are a lot of different reactions, right? Some people are angry about the election. Some people are sad. Some people are relieved. You know, they, they got thrown into this in an orange wave in 2011 and did their jobs and did them well, but, you know, are kind of a little bit happy to be able to go back to their lives pre-election. Um, I ran into a good friend, Liberal MP for Cape Breton Canso, Roger Kuzner. Mm -hmm. And when he saw me, this is, this is maybe two weeks after the election, maybe three weeks after the election. He saw me and he smiled, and then this look came across his face, and I don't know how to describe it, except it, he looked concerned. And, and he gave me a hug, and he was talking to me, and he was talking to me about all the supports that are available for MPs who lose. And he wanted to make sure that I knew about all of them. And there are. are there are, there are. Like real supports? S supports, like if there is counseling, um, there, there is a, uh, uh, somebody who's there to help you transition. I mean, it's a job transition, right? A lot of workplaces have those kinds uh, of tools. Is this the Parliament of Canada provides Parliament, them? yeah. I, I know it's, it, it's relatively early, mm -hmm. actually, since October 19th. But at this stage in, in the sort of recovery process, if you want to call it that, what, what's the lesson you're, you're taking from this? Um, the lesson... I'm trying to think what lessons have taken from losing. It's been it's been such a whirlwind. I mean, it is you know, on the one hand, it is democracy. That's that's yeah. how it works, right? Absolutely. You know, you put yourself forward, and you either win or lose. Your party yeah. either wins or loses, and so it comes with the process. But it seems, at times, having yeah. watched this myself over decades now, that the toll can be much greater than most people realize. Mm -hmm. It, one thing that I've really clearly understood is the fact that it's this job evaluation or performance evaluation every four years that you do your best, you perform your best in this performance evaluation. Not only is your performance sometimes not taken into account, it's someone else doing the interview. It's your leader 
doing the interview. It's your party doing the interview. And so you have no control over that process. So you give it your best shot. You do the best that you can, but you do need to fully, completely understand that it isn't all about you. And no matter what you do, there may be a moment where something like a wave comes along and, and you get taken out with it. So having to be at peace with the fact that you, you did it the way that it should be done, that you did it right and you can still lose, I think you need to, you need to really be at peace with that. Now, the full interview with Megan Leslie will be seen this weekend on One on One at the Times right there on your screen. In a moment, the insiders will be here, Jamie, Kathleen and David, with more on the politics of losing. Most people would probably say Megan Leslie was pretty blunt in that interview a few moments ago about what losing is actually like. We should note she's relaxed and renewed now with a new job in a senior role at the World Wildlife Fund Canada. But losing is a part of politics and we rarely talk about its impact on people. So Jamie and David have some thoughts on this too. They're here in Toronto and Kathleen does as well. She's in Orlando, Florida tonight. Uh, Jamie, why don't you start us? Uh, do we, uh, we really don't think about that impact on people that, that often, do we, about losing? No, because it's a game about winning. And because everybody is so focused on winning, we really don't focus on losing. And, you know, we heard from Megan Leslie what it's like for an elected person to lose. But they weren't just the only ones that lost in the uh, election of the 19th. There were all kinds of staffers and other people who really commit their lives to this. And all of a sudden, they find themselves out. He asked why it's different than losing... Uh, your job uh, in, a, in a factory or in a sales job or something else. And one of the ways it's different is because it's something that you only do for a short period of time. So often it's quite disruptive to try and return to whatever your occupation was. Kathleen? Yeah, I agree with all that Jamie just said, but more than I'd add, the, the interesting thing or what's different about being a politician and, and then being laid off or fired, really, uh, by the public is that when you're a politician, Every moment of your day, your waking hour is scheduled. You're 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 in high demand. You're at the center of attention. Then all of a sudden, you lose an election, and you're all alone. No staff, no resources. You're filing claims by yourself. Uh, it's quite difficult. David. Well, I mean, I, I think those of us that are active in politics think about it a lot because most political careers end in defeat. And so, any of us that have been involved, all three of us for sure, know a lot of people who've lost, uh, either before they were ever elected or were elected for a period of time and lost. And, and you know that there's a tremendous personal toll um, that goes on in that. You have been, it's different from losing your job in other areas in a, in a few ways. First of all, as Jamie said, it's not likely that being a, in Parliament will not have advanced your ability to get back on the roster as a school teacher, will not have helped your uh, hardware store that you were running or working in. So it's very difficult and disruptive to your career. But the second thing is, it's very personal. It's very public. It's very, in, in the whole community knows that this is, has happened to you. And the last thing is, for most people, it's the end of a dream that most people have been thinking about for a long time in their lives to get to that point, and uh, so it's pretty personally crushing as well. You know, there, there are going to be people watching this tonight who are going to say, well, hey, you know, this is the nature of the game, so to speak. You know, you win some, you lose some, as, as we talked to Megan Leslie about. Why does this matter in terms of the system? Uh, Kathleen? But you have to remember that these people who get involved in politics do so because of a personal passion that they want to serve. And many of them, even after losing, go on to continue to serve. I mean, I talked to Andrew Cash a, a few weeks ago, and, and he's busy um, working on the same issues that brought him into politics in the first place, issues of precarious work, unpaid interns, and, and organizing the arts and cultural sectors. So there's many ways there can be life after politics, and you can continue the work that you're really passionate about. You know, you, you've all seen situations where it doesn't end nicely, you know, for politicians. It takes, you know, we all have. There, it takes a long time for them to get over losing. Some can't even walk in the streets of their, their riding because right. they, they worry about these things, Dave. Yeah, it, it's, very, it's very difficult for the local candidates. I have a lot more sympathy for the local candidate than I do for the leaders when they lose because the leaders are at least in charge of their own fortunes. 
um, and the authors of their own fate. Uh, whereas, as Megan said in the interview, MPs are really hostage to how well the leader and the party do uh, in the campaign. And yet, it's your name that's on the ballot. It's you that will be described as having lost in that community. And so it is... It is very personal for people, and I've known candidates who were pillars of their community, who were known as, uh, you know, sort of former mayors and most most important citizen, all that kind of stuff, who literally moved away because they couldn't walk down the street and look at people that they thought were friends who they knew hadn't voted for them. You know, Peter, it's particularly hard for those people who get confused between who they are and the job that they're doing for a period of time. And when those two things get mixed up, it becomes very hard for it to become unpacked. I'll give you a personal example. We were in government, there was a big fancy AIDS fundraiser that takes place in Toronto every year, and a big company used to call me the second that date was announced and offer me two seats at their table. And after we lost, I was talking to one of my best friends who was a Liberal MPP, Dominic Agostino, he's since died. So I talked to him every day. And uh, I called him one day. I said, how was your day, Dom? He said, it was great. He said, this company called and offered me two seats at their uh, table at the fundraiser this year. And uh, it's very important to realize those weren't my tickets. Those were tickets for, given to the person who was doing a job. And when you get mixed up on that, when it all stops, it can be pretty traumatic for people. You know, Kathleen, one of the things that, that uh, Megan Leslie talked about that I was not aware of, and apparently a lot of MPs aren't aware of, is that there actually is a program for defeated MPs. It's true. The House of Commons runs a career transition program. They provide some financial planning assistance and even some career transition and counselling services. But it's true, very few people uh, take, very few MPs take advantage of it. But it's not all doom and gloom. You know, you have to remember, I, I talked to another MP who I won't name, and he said to me, oh, Kathleen, there is an upside to all of this. My blood pressure has stabilized. It's been <laughs> in, in, in the normal range yeah. now. <laughs> I think that the, 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 the issue about the transition is, brings up a really interesting point because one of the reasons why this is more difficult for people than it ought to be is because the private sector has no respect for politics in this country. In the United States, you serve some time in Congress or in the Senate and then you leave or you're defeated and business people think, this person's obviously sharp, talented, able, I'm going to bring that person in. They have a much easier transition to the private sector. For some reason, people in business in Canada think that politics as Kevin O'Leary recently said, politics is easier than business. It isn't, and there's a wealth of talent, uh, both at the elected level and the staff level in politics, that the economy writ large disregards in this country. Okay, I'm going to leave you with a picture that was on Twitter by our good friend uh, Don Martin over at CTV, who captured this picture of someone who lost on October 19th, not their own seat, but lost government. That's Stephen Harper arriving in Florida uh, today, apparently very happy smiling and being greeted by by people uh, at the uh, Fort Myers airport. So there's always an upside sometimes. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's, maybe he's Fort gonna... Myers in a baseball hat. Fort Myers in a baseball hat. <laughs> okay, that's what it's come to. Maybe he's going to bump into... Uh, uh, into Kathleen down there. Yeah. Maybe you told him he could have the job We're back. He'd turn around and fly right back. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> okay, listen, thank you all for this. Good to chat. Have fun down in Florida. It must be tough uh, down there right now. Uh, Jamie and David here in uh, Toronto.